What if what's killing the bees is killing us as well? I am who I am because we are all connected. I learnt this from the bees. They taught me that there's a connection between Himalayan monks, mobile toilets and dandelions. When I was growing up, there were two facts that just sort of came into my consciousness and floated around for years until I was able to sort of fit them together and make sense. The first one was that monks in the Himalayas were living well into their hundreds. And it was put down to the fact they were drinking glacier milk. Glacier milk is just the water that's running off the top of the Himalayas. It's milky white and that's due to the minerals in it. So that was interesting, didn't know quite what to do with that, but it's stuck in there. The second fact was from two different friends. When I was growing up, I grew up in Dorset on the Somerset border. And of course we're festival region. And when you have festivals, you need toilets. And when you have mobile toilets, you need someone to clean them. Not a job I fancied. However, a couple of my friends thought this would be a really good little job to do on the side. Interestingly, both of them told me that the biggest problem their bosses faced was knowing what to do with the literally mountains of undigested mineral supplements. Crazy. Again, I didn't know why I stuck that little nugget in my head, but it did give me a very healthy scepticism of any kind of supplements. Now, I haven't always been a beekeeper. I had a career for 20 years as an artist. And when I was right at the peak of my career, selling my paintings in London and in America, and filled with excitement of the potential of where my business would go next, I fell ill. And shortly after my 40th birthday, I found I was bed and wheelchair bound. It was another six years before I received the diagnosis of a genetic connective tissue disorder, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I learned to adapt and rather than thinking about what I couldn't do, which was my beloved painting, and that was what I always thought my purpose was, was to be an artist and spread the love of flowers through my big paintings. I had to think about what I could do, which was very limited. Now, for years, I'd had this feeling that I wanted to keep bees. No one in my family kept bees. I didn't know anyone who kept bees, so I have no idea where this came from. I also knew that if I had a beehive, the bees would come. So Greg, my husband, built me a beehive. And he put it in the garden and the bees came. They came through a local beekeeper called Chris an amazing chap. He put some bees in the hive and every week he would come and visit our house and I'd be wheeled out and propped up and pretend to be well for an hour or so while we worked with the bees. And he taught me everything about bees. I loved it, absolutely hooked. And our first harvest of honey was 140 pounds of honey. I had no idea if that was any good. I thought that was normal. Now, I'd be very pleased with 40 pounds of honey from a hive. However, we took the honey, he helped us extract it, we spun it all out, we put it into jars and we split it 50-50. So we had 70 jars each. I had 70 glass jars beautifully labelled in my house and I knew I had the perfect gift for all my family and friends for that winter. I felt like a proper beekeeper. The next week, Chris visited and he had a big parcel. Oh, what have you got? He said, it's for the bees. So out we went. And as we got to the hive, he carefully unwrapped this parcel. So what is it? It's sugar, sugar fondant. We have to feed the bees. We've taken all the honey. I was horrified. I was heartbroken. I felt ashamed. I suddenly realised what we'd done. We'd taken all their honey 
and we were expecting those bees, my beautiful, beloved bees that I was so grateful for, for all the honey they'd given us. We were expecting them to live on a diet of white sugar from August to April. Now, if I fed my young boys or my husband white sugar, <laughs> how healthy do you think they'd be come April? They might be a bit buzzy. <laughs> <laughs> but what did I know? I was a newbie. I was a new beekeeper and everyone does it. I was a difficult student for poor Chris because I challenged him with everything he suggested. I was like, well, why are we doing this? How do we do that? So it wasn't easy for Chris either, but it put me on a quest, a quest to find out where the bees were healthy and also where the humans were healthy. I had to find out how to make myself healthy. So I knew that there was something in what I was doing, that reconnection with natural, with nature or natural things and with nature. So what was it about what I was doing? What was the difference? What was it about the bees? I then came across a study by the Welsh Botanic Gardens. They've got 8,000 species of plants and they have bees and they have delicious honey. So they sent the honey off to get it tasted, tested because they wanted to know what exactly were the bees feeding off to make this amazing honey. When the results came back, they were quite astonished. It seemed the bees were flying over these 8,000 exotic plants and going to the woodlands and the hedgerows and the wild areas outside. And they were favoring just 11 species of flowers. They included hawthorn, blackthorn, willow, hazel, brambles, ivy, and dandelions, my favorite flower. <laughs> so why would this be? Why would the bees go for these weeds outside the gardens? What's going on? So then I started to look into dandelions because I quite was interested in dandelions. My father had spent 55 years trying to kill the things. So I wanted to know <laughs> what was special about them. So it turns out dandelions have really long tap roots and they reach deep into the soil and they find the rock forms of calcium and potassium and they process them and they put them through their long roots right up to the surface and they turn them into a plant-based form of calcium and potassium. So if you want those minerals, just eat dandelion leaves. Now the real magic of that is that orchards, where we have our apple trees, which we have all around Somerset, they have shallow roots. They can't reach the rock forms of these minerals deep in the soil. So they depend on the dandelions to bring them to the surface. Isn't this great? The dandelions have a purpose. They're working with their environment. Now the real magic about dandelions is the seeds. They have these wonderful seed heads and the seeds are taken by the wind for up to 60 miles. So you can't blame your neighbors if you've got dandelions in your garden. <laughs> But these seeds will only take root in soil that needs calcium and potassium. Wow. So what about all those plants outside the Welsh Botanic Gardens? Were they all fulfilling their purpose? Were they each processing different minerals and the bees knew it? The bees were called to these weeds to feed themselves? searching for the most nutritious food to make the most nutritious honey to feed humanity. Isn't that something to think about? Millions of years ago, the earth was covered in weeds and plants and trees, and they were all given the freedom to move, to fulfill their purpose. I wonder What's happened with us? Do we have a purpose? Those millions of years ago, all these plants, they got frozen 
And then they were only the purpose revealed as the glaciers melted and the monks drank. So perhaps if we look at what is going on in the world, what is our purpose, what's our role? Have we lost our connection with nature? My condition shows that lack of connection, connective tissue disorder. My lack of connection with nature had made me sick. And as I reconnected, I feel healthy. So if we could reconnect and find our purpose within nature, perhaps we'd stop killing the weeds and the bees. After all, we can't kill them without killing ourselves because we are all connected. Thank you.